Hello there, I'm Amira David. This is Boom Bust, and these are the stories we are tracking for you today. While the European Union cuts its Eurozone growth forecast for 2016, despite this being the third year of consecutive growth for the EU, and I'll tell you why expectations are now being pulled back straight ahead. Then Steve Keen is on the show. We'll get his thoughts on the path forward for China, emerging markets, a global economy, all of that, that's coming right up. And then in today's big deal, Ed Harrison and I are talking about the faltering pharmaceutical company Valiant amidst allegations of price gouging. Questions are now arising over whether Valiant is even able to generate real growth. We've got that and a whole lot more coming up for you on today's show. Don't go anywhere. Boomba starts right now. The European Union's recovery will remain subdued. That's all according to an economic forecast published by the European Commission on Thursday that says increased global weakness could impede the EU's positive momentum. Gross domestic product in the Eurozone is set to grow at a pace of 1.8% in 2016. That's down from a previous forecast in May of 1.9%. However, the projection for this year is actually up, with GDP now expected to grow at 1.6% from the previous estimate of one5 back in May. There's no doubt that the Eurozone is currently benefiting from a quantitative easing program in place that allows for the ECB to purchase billions of euros in assets to help weaken the euro and, of course, help boost exports. At the same time, the drop in oil prices has arguably left consumers with more money in their pockets. That said, those factors are being overshadowed for the future. They're being overshadowed by more fundamental problems in many Eurozone economies. Analysts point to high levels of private debt, along with non-performing loans, as some of the impediments to long-term growth. Outside of debt, Eurozone nations are struggling to cut unemployment. According to the European Commission, as of September, unemployment in Greece is over 25 percent. Spain is over 22. And the overall currency union is at about 11 percent unemployment. It's that coupled with the external factors like the slowdown in China and the impending Fed interest rate hike that economists now say will cause major headwinds in the years to come. All right, now moving right along here to a new development created by Google that some are calling scary. It's a new smart Gmail feature that will be able to scan your email and offer quick replies that you can send based on the content. That means it literally anticipates your reply to something that's said and gives you a few options of what you might like to say in return. So how does it work? Well, it uses uh, what are called recurrent neural networks. It's computer software that can basically mimic the human, human brain. And the more you use the feature, the more it learns what kinds of responses you give, the better it customizes suggestions for your reply. Now, before your mind wanders off, Google, Google does say this is simply a tool that at no point are humans ever reading your private email. But for those of you skeptical folks out there, you may just want to stick to the basics. All right, staying on tech here, we got an update out of Airbnb after a fierce political campaign in San Francisco. The short-term home rental giant has managed to defeat Proposition F, a city ballot initiative seeking to put new restrictions on the company's business operations. But the fight, it seems, is not over. And RT correspondent Manuel Rapolo is here to share with us why, what, what's going on here. So first of all, let, let's be clear, Airbnb spent 8.5 million dollars on this counter campaign against Proposition F in San Francisco. What exactly was 
you know, was the issue here? I mean, what exactly would this have meant for the company if this measure had gone through? Sure. Well, this is definitely a big win for Airbnb, um, but it's also an expected win. Like you mentioned, they spent $8.5 million. To With defeat. that much money. That's a lot of money. Right. We had mentioned uh, previously on the show that, you know, you usually see this kind of money reserved for political campaigns. Uh, you did have several groups that were, that were, that were fighting Airbnb. Airbnb, the mm -hmm. folks that were behind Proposition F, these are the, the, the hotel unions, the tenants' right groups, landlord organizations, these types of folks, all of whom are saying that Airbnb, uh, through these short-term uh, home rentals, are undercutting hotel jobs or saying that they're exacerbating the housing crisis. Um, but the question is, what would have happened to Airbnb had this measure passed? Uh, they would have had to provide uh, updates on how many um, of these housing units are, are being rented out throughout the city. It would have put in a, a limit of 75 nights out of the year that these homes could be rented out. And interesting little caveat, they would have actually given neighbors to some of these homes the ability to sue the company if these new regulations that were, would have been put in place had been violated. Of course, Airbnb has come out saying that, uh, you know, reiterating their same stance that this isn't exacerbating the housing crisis. If anything, it's giving low-income families an opportunity to stay in the city. We know that we were talking about the rents in some U.S. cities, San Francisco consistently right. ranking at the top. Uh, this it's, it's part of a larger housing crisis that's pushing low-income families out of the city. Right. So it did avoid a lot, but it is still important because the fight is not over, as far as I understand. Um, San Francisco is not the only city trying to really uh, hit the company with these new regulations. What can you tell me about that? Well, right. The fight certainly isn't over, and the company knows that the, the the question here is whether or not Airbnb will continue to be shelling out 8.5 million dollars, 10 million dollars every single time that a, uh, a a challenge comes up against their their business model. I can't answer that, but it doesn't seem like it would be a wise financial strategy for the company in the long run. Uh, other cities, like you mentioned, are pursuing their own measures, countering uh, the business practices of Airbnb. Just to give you an example here. Um, Santa Monica, California, they're pursuing legal action against uh, against rentals that are banned under existing city regulations. Portland, Oregon has already a million dollars worth of fines against home sharing websites like Airbnb. There's a $2.5 million lawsuit that was filed against HomeAway.com. That's a sort of competitor mm -hmm. to Airbnb. Uh, Los Angeles, they haven't really passed anything, but they've been very vocal about this. And even right here in Washington, D.C., you're seeing a challenge uh, being proposed to these same practices that are offered by Airbnb. Right. And you mentioned HomeAway.com. I'm glad you did because uh, that made big news recently. Uh, Expedia announced that it would be acquiring HomeAway.com, as you mentioned, the the larger competitor to Airbnb. How big of a deal is this? Oh, it's a it's a really big deal. Expedia has been buying up travel sites left and right, especially this year. Um, just to give you an idea uh, of, of of what we're talking about, in January they purchased wow. Travelocity for 280 million. That's with a million, like you see on that chart there. They purchased Orbits in February. That was valued at 1.2 billion dollars. And just now this week, we're learning about this $3.9 billion purchase of HomeAway.com. That's the, the single largest acquisition of a, of a, of a travel, travel wow. site that we've yeah, seen. I was just looking at that. Right. That's I mean, it, it's huge news. It's big for Expedia. HomeAway.com, they're an established uh, travel rental vacation company. Yeah, they're not like a little, you know, small company. Right. It's, it's, not huge. Like, it's not like they're coming out of nowhere. But I, I wouldn't say that they're posing a threat to Airbnb. Uh, it, it's more of, of a sign that Expedia is wanting to grow, wanting to to get into that uh, sector of the market, this short-term rentals. Airbnb is valued at $25.5 billion. Right. They're not going anywhere. Yeah, and as you could see on that slide, they're just, the acquisitions are getting larger and larger and larger. It started in the millions. Now, yeah. here we, you know, it's in the billions. It's a bigger market. And I should mention, it's the largest acquisition of a travel site in history. Right. So it is a big deal. Manny Rapolo, we ran out of time. We always do with Thanks you. for having me on. Thank you for coming on. Okay, President Obama recently signed a two-year $80 billion budget deal into law that extends the U.S.'s borrowing capacity and avoids a crippling government shutdown. However, the new law does call for the elimination of two popular Social Security claiming measures. So, the question is, is that the type of sacrifice that has to be made now in order to deal with the national debt? That's exactly what our very own Bianca Vashini posed to Paul Craig Roberts. He's a regular on the show. He's the chairman of the Institute for Political Economy. And here's what he had to say. Well, uh, the economic policy of the United States is basically uh, focused on saving the financial sector. And so uh, to the extent that the government worries about the budget deficit, um, then ordinary people will pay. 
Now these two particular Social Security features that they are eliminating, uh, they're not really harmful to the basic structure of the benefits. Uh, this, th these were two sort of loopholes in there that certain people could take advantage of to uh, raise their benefits above what they would have been. And <clears throat> so it's not that kind of an attack. Um, but I do think that Social Security will come on increasing attack because the uh, neoliberal view, uh, particularly the Republican view, but Democrats, many of them also have this view, is that um, government shouldn't provide any benefits for anybody except the rich. <laughs> the 1%, the they should have low taxes and bailouts, but you shouldn't do anything for anybody else. Somehow that's socialism. So I, I do think that Social Security will be under attack for that reason. It'll be for ideological reasons, not for budget reasons. Again, that was Paul Craig Roberts. You can check out the rest of that interview tomorrow right here on Boomba. Stay tuned for that. And time now for a quick break. Stick around. When we return, Steve Keen will give us his take on debt sustainability in Portugal. Then in today's big deal, Ed Harrison and I are talking about the faltering pharmaceutical company Valiant. It's facing allegations of price gouging. We'll tell you about it on the other side. Stay with us. And as we go to break, here are the closing numbers at the bell. Most people think to stand out in this business, you need to be the first one on top of the story or the person with the loudest voice or the biggest ratings. In truth, to stand out in the news business, you just need to ask the right questions and demand the right answers. Question more. All right, welcome back to the show to talk about China and Portugal. We've got Steve Keen with us. He's the head of economics, history, and politics at Kingston University. He's been writing a lot about China. And recently, he said that the signs of a big crack in the great facade of China are everywhere. Ed first asked him what he meant by that, and here's what he had to say. Well, again, <laughs> the ironic thing is that the reason China got us out of the crisis was they turned on the spigots of credit. Because when the, when the crisis hit back in 2008, uh, it trashed China's export strategy. Uh, the, I, think, I think the collapse in their export, uh, exports were of the order of 40% in one year. That's how, how much the downturn of the global economy hit their export strategy. And people were moving back from the cities to the countryside in millions. And the Chinese response was, we've got to boost demand domestically. And the easiest way to do that was to boost lending. Now, of course, in China, we call it a capitalist country. But they're five, I think they've got five major banks, and they're all state-owned. And at the same, and of course, a lot of the businesses themselves, either state ventures or spun off from state ventures. And the, a lot of the bosses are Communist Party members themselves. So when the Communist Party tells you to lend money and you're a bank, you go and lend money. And when it's on offer, you don't refuse it early on. So you had an incredible growth in private debt, uh, as recorded by the Bank of International Settlements in China, starting in 2009. It went from 80 percent of GDP, 100 percent of GDP in 2009, to 180 percent at the beginning of this year. Now, when I graph that level of debt, ratio of debt to GDP, and started it from the beginning of the bubble, which is 2009, and then compared that to Japan, whose bubble began, I think, back in 83, and America's, which began in 1992, 1993, the rate of growth of American Chinese debt is three times as fast as either Japan or America experienced. So consequently, when you've got debt growing that fast, 
it slow down can be just as just as dramatic and that's what we're going through right now the hitting of the order of 200 percent of gdp in the latest figures from the bank of international settlements for household and non-financial sector private debt in china and it's got to slow down from growth rates that have been as high as 35 percent of gdp in one year the slowdown itself i mean the sum of turnover of existing money plus the change in new debt which i take as the metric of total demand for everything in an economy will have to collapse and i can see something of the order of a 10 or 15 percent fall in total demand in china uh, coming out of that slowdown well you know uh, b before we get to that point do you think that the chinese slowdown that we're seeing already is the big macro event that's infecting the emerging markets and causing the emerging markets overall to slow down oh yeah i mean um i'm not i'm not as aware of the figures in other countries as i am of china i'm not quite really it's like i don't know india's data for example but uh, clearly this is the beginning of the end of the uh, the, the 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 vaulted bricks in that sense because we're all sort of in Brazil fall over Russia hasn't exactly shining and China is now going to go into a big slump and from, from what they're doing the Communist Party reaction to that has been to try to restore the bubble which I think is, is totally a forlorn uh, campaign they can do it for a short while they simply can't maintain it so uh, that's the end of the emerging markets as a sign of, of, of boosts to growth and from what I've heard anecdotally around Southeast Asia uh, it appears we're into a, we could be in for another version of the 1997 crash with, on top of that, a scale of a downturn from China we've never seen before. Uh, well, that's not very cheery news, uh, Steve. So I, I want to turn to something that's, that's probably not cheery, but from a different angle, a bit closer to home for you, and that's Portugal. Uh, let me tell you how I see Portugal, and then mm -hmm. I'll ask you for your view here. Uh, now, Portugal's recent general election was inconclusive without any party winning an absolute majority. The president allowed Prime Minister Pedro Passos Coelho to form a minority government, as has been done in the past, when you get this kind of result. However, the way that he's gone about doing this has created a huge controversy. I mean, some people are calling it a coup. I'm not one of those people, but I do think that Portugal has a tough road ahead regarding debt sustainability. Now, I know you have a view on this. Uh, what do you make of what's happening in Portugal right now? I think it's the most obvious sign of the death of democracy in Europe. Uh, and, and this is actually, in some ways, the consequence of the European Union itself and the, uh, the formation of the Euro in particular. A huge ambition in Europe after the Second World War was to stop politics mattering. And in some ways, the way that, that was done was to make the European Union a non-democratic institution. And the Euro itself is a classic uh, non-democratic uh, institution. And finally, you get to the stage where that would only have worked at the economic program that the Euro, the, Euro, the Eurozone and the Euro in particular had embarked upon was going to be a successful campaign. But of course, we, I don't need to tell anybody it's failed. And the reason it's failed is because they've put, they, they didn't create a treasury, they, they limited government spending, they ignored growth in private debt, which caused the bubbles which then crashed. So it's a total catastrophe. Now, in that situation, rather than maintaining an absence of democracy for the sake of prosperity and peace they're maintaining an absence of democracy and enforcing poverty on people throughout southern europe so it's it's really a breaking point when they when they simply say you can't vote for a party that wants to leave the euro uh, you that's no longer a political option uh, there's nothing more political in that sense than poverty but that's what's being imposed on people saying you can't choose anything other than poverty because that's the only effective program we're going to allow you to run in your economy. Well, you know, Steve, this is a country that has a, a had a deficit uh, in excess of 7% in 2014. Public debt is is well over 120% of GDP. External debt is over 200% of GDP and total public and private debt is 370% of GDP. So in a recession, obviously these figures are going to go higher. For Portugal's debt to be sustainable, given the present institutional framework which you outlined and the economic paradigm, austerity, uh, you know, that has to bring the deficit down and nominal GDP has to grow for decades for this whole thing to work. None of this sounds plausible to me in any it way, might, shape, no. or form. I mean, wh wh what's the potential no, not, for no. uh, um, credit sustainability to diminish significantly going forward? 
Oh, I think it's an inevitability. Uh, the conditions, as you've outlined, that level of debt, particularly you said 120% of GDP is the government debt and 370% total. I haven't checked figures, Portugal's figures. That, that's saying Portugal's private debt 2.5 times GDP. Again, this is a sign that it's private debt which caused the bubble beforehand and private debt that's caused the crisis by not growing afterwards. The only way out of this is to slash levels of private debt, which is why I've been arguing for a modern debt jubilee now for over five years. But that's the last thing that people are focusing upon. They're saying we must reduce the government debt by active economic policy. What I'm saying is we should actually reduce the level of private debt by active government policy using the state's capacity to create money to cancel private debt. And until we do that, in a way that doesn't disadvantage savers, by the way, uh, we're going to be stuck in this, in this nightmare. And what the euro is doing is actually making the nightmare more extreme. Now for today's big deal, I'm sitting here with Ed Harrison. We're talking about Valiant Pharmaceuticals, the company that is just getting all the headlines these days. Now, Valiant, uh, its stock hit a two-year low of $76 during Thursday's trading session. The speculation is that it may have something to do with Wednesday's news that lawmakers are now launching a bipartisan investigation into the company for price gouging. Uh, Ed, that chart, that's yeah, terrible. that chart there, man, it does not look good. The <laughs> stock is down, I should say, by more than 70%. That is incredible. Um, so, you know, a large amount in a bull market. Tell us what's going on here. What really happened? Yeah, so uh, I think you can go back to August the 14th. That's when it really started. Remember, you had that conversation with... Um, with Alex Tabarrok about Turing Pharmaceuticals. They're doing price gouging on Daraprim, which is one of the uh, HIV drugs that right. they have. And so, as it turns out, Valiant was doing the same thing. And so Bernie Sanders and Elijah Cummings uh, got together and investigated uh, uh, th this uh, price gouging, or so-called price gouging in August. By September 28th, uh, the, uh, it, it went to 18 Democratic leaders who were calling for a subpoena from the country because they were outraged that uh, this was happening. The overall market was down, but Valiant went down 16 percent that day. Then a week later, Deutsche Bank came out and said, by the way, actually, it's not just two, uh, two drugs because uh, they had only gotten two. It was 54 drugs Ouch. that had gone up over 60 percent on wow. average. Uh, in that year. And so eventually by October the 14th, Valiant had a uh, subpoena for its drug pricing policy. And later it came out that there was a company related to Valiant called uh, Philidor, which is a specialty pharmacy company, which was engaged in dubious billing practices to, uh, to uh, insurance companies. And yeah. so all of this came to a head and, and you know, the, the price uh, just tanked as a result. It's amazing. I mean, we were just talking about how it snowballed um, really from there, from that uh, touring pharmaceuticals uh, scandal, if you want to call it a scandal. And now uh, it's interesting because questions, in addition to the price gouging, um, they've got another issue because questions are now arising over whether Valiant is actually a, a roll up. And I want you first to explain what that really means. Yeah, so basically, it's not just uh, these dubious practices and uh, potential ethics around that, but it's the fact that uh, their whole strategy is to go out, buy lots of companies, roll them up into a conglomerate company, and then uh, do sort of aggressive accounting uh, tricks in order to... As they merge? As they merge. Oh, okay. And then you think somehow that uh, th this is a company that's growing uh, exponentially, but the, que the real problem is, is you have no idea what the real financials look like. So There's no steady state financials for Valiant, and you have to basically take the word of the company that uh, things are proceeding well. So it's basically superficial. Well, that's you know exactly what Berkshire Hathaway Vice Chairman Charlie Munger says he finds really problematic, and he's laid out a, a, a few uh, gripes that he has with the company. He, I know he mentioned ITT. What have been his uh, biggest critiques? Yeah, so I think that he actually used the word immoral. He talked about it being an immoral and unsustainable business practice that's not consistent with what a value investor wants to get out of it. Now, the immorality obviously comes from 
uh, the price gouging. But his point is, is, is that these are the kinds of business practices which are not sustainable over the long term. And when you add this into this whole roll-up phenomenon, this is a company that is very much like ITT was, which during the go-go years of the late 60s and then early 70s was a conglomerate that everyone thought was, you know, the best. The right. go-go years, they had the Nifty 50, ITT was one of these companies that everyone thought was the greatest. But as it turns out, uh, really, they didn't have very good organic growth. Wow. And then the whole thing fell apart, and they had to split up the conglomerate. Yeah, and those theories became pretty clear when the company, I guess, tried to acquire Allergan. Tell me about that. Yeah, so when Valiant tried to acquire Allergan, the Allergan people, they took a look at what, they, uh, uh, what was there. And they said that, actually, we don't want to be involved with this company because basically, uh, the board said, when we look at the the the, uh, the R and D, these guys are spending three percent on R and D, so they're not an R and D company at all. All they're really doing is gimmicking stuff. Mm. And in fact, when they buy these other companies, they sh they cut their R and D to the bone. So really, this is all about marketing, accounting, uh, aggressive roll-ups, etc. We do not think that this is a company that uh, merges at all well with our strategy. Do not allow them to take us over. Right. So that that merger never happened. So there was a lot between the lines, and they were able to sniff it out then. Uh, there's one person uh, who seemingly called this a long time ago, and that's Jim Chanos, and he seems to be pretty aggressively calling out, you know, all the, you know, the the the, the bad dogs, I guess, in the business. Um, tell me what it is that he saw that other people on Wall Street didn't see. Yeah, I think that he saw fast growth uh, of a company that uh, it wasn't clear what their business strategy was other than uh, uh, financial engineering. Mm. So when you see a company that is financially engineered and that's growing so fast, you got to wonder, is that sustainable? And when he uh, looked under the hood and looked into their 10Ks, he saw all of these things that we're talking about with regard to the roll-up strategy, and that's when he started to short sell the company. Indeed. It's important to be skeptical, keep that thinking hat on. Ed Harrison, thanks so much for weighing in on that. We love hearing from you guys. Tweet at all of us, Aaron Aid, Edward MH, Bianca Faschini, Amira David. Remember, you can see all the segments featured on YouTube. Make sure you check us out there. We'll see you next time, guys. Take care.